Hello, people of God. It's good to be with you and to have the chance to open God's Word together today. And so I'm going to look at 1 Timothy once again as we think about the outline of this book. And I want to read uh, chapters 2 and 3 of 1 Timothy to give us a sense of uh, Paul's instructions to Timothy in this letter. So 1 Timothy, beginning at chapter 2, verse 1, let's pay careful attention, for this is God's own word. First of all, then, I urge that supplications, prayers, intercessions, and thanksgivings be made for all people, for kings and all who are in high positions, that we may lead a peaceful and quiet life, godly and dignified in every way. This is good, and it is pleasing in the sight of God our Savior, who desires all people to be saved and to come to the knowledge of truth. For there is one God, and there is one mediator between God and men, the man Christ Jesus, who gave himself as a ransom for all, which is the testimony given at the proper time. For this I was appointed a preacher and an apostle, I am telling the truth, I am not lying, a teacher of the Gentiles in faith and truth. I desire then that in every place men should pray, lifting holy hands without anger or quarreling. Likewise also that women should adorn themselves in respectable apparel, with modesty and self-control, not with braided hair and gold and, or pearls or costly attire, but what, with what is proper for women who profess godliness with good works. Let a woman learn quietly with all submissiveness. I do not permit a woman to teach or exercise authority over a man. Rather, she is to remain quiet. For Adam was formed first, then Eve. And Adam was not deceived, but the woman was deceived and became a transgressor. Yet she will be saved through childbearing if they continue in faith and love and holiness with self-control. The tr saying is trustworthy. If anyone aspires to the office of overseer, he desires a noble task. Therefore, an overseer must be above reproach, the husband of one wife sober-minded, self-controlled, respectable, hospitable, able to teach, not a drunkard, not violent, but gentle, not quarrelsome, not a lover of money. He must manage his own household well with all dignity, keeping his children submissive. For if someone does not know how to manage his own household, how will he care for God's church? He must not be a recent convert, or he may become puffed up with conceit, and fall into the condemnation of the devil. Moreover, he must be well thought of by outsiders, so that he may not fall into disgrace, into a snare of the devil. Deacons likewise must be dignified, not double-tongued, not addicted to much wine, not greedy for dishonest gain. They must hold the mystery of the faith with a clear conscience, and let them also be tested first, then let them serve as deacons if they prove themselves blameless. Their wives likewise must be dignified, not slanderers, but sober-minded, faithful in all things. Let deacons each be the husband of one wife, managing their children and their own households well. For those who serve well as deacons gain a good standing for themselves, and also great confidence in the faith that is in Christ Jesus. I hope to come to you soon, but I am writing these things to you that if I delay, you may know how one ought to behave in the household of God, which is the church of the living God, a pillar and buttress of the truth. Great indeed, we confess, is the mystery of godliness. He was manifested in the flesh, vindicated by the Spirit, seen by angels, proclaimed among the nations, believed on in the world, taken up into glory. Um, and so thus far the reading of God's word, may he bless it to us. So this is uh, what Timothy is about. Uh, First Timothy was written as Paul wrote, we, we talked last time about this being one of the pastoral epistles, uh, particularly written to pastors on how to pastor the church, and they each have an individual focus, and the particular focus of First Timothy is public worship and the proper organization of the church being essential for the church's welfare, um, and we see that playing out in chapters 2 and 3. So we want to consider the outline of this, of this book and think about how Paul organizes these instructions to Timothy speaking specifically about the public worship of the church and the proper organization of the church. Um, well, Paul has a word for Timothy in chapter 1. Uh, he tells Timothy that he's journeyed to Macedonia, leaving Timothy in Ephesus to combat prevalent heresies. Uh, he thanks the God who made him the chief of sinners, a minister of the gospel. And so that's what Paul uh, recounts in chapter 1, sort of his, his story, and then gives the directions for public worship. So we read about those in chapter 2. 
Uh, there are directions for men. Men must lift up holy hands in prayer for all classes of people, uh, for this is the will of God, the Savior, that all be saved. Um, so men are given instructions for worship. Also women are given instructions. Uh, women must dress in, a, in becoming attire and must not teach, but must learn in quietness with all submissiveness. Um, one of the things that seems to be there seems to have been some confusion over is the roles of men and women in in Ephesus. Maybe some people beginning to think that uh, just because we are there in Christ, there is no male or female, as Paul would say in Galatians. That means that no longer do men have to act like men or women have to act like women. And Paul is still telling both men and women to to do what they're called to do uh, in worship, particularly uh, that men, that women are to dress like respectable women. Uh, women are to uh, have a certain role in worship. It doesn't mean women are incapable of being leaders or teachers in the church. It's just not that's not the role God has given to them. Um, it's not about ability. It's about calling. Um, and Paul is reminding Timothy of the differences we have in our in our various callings uh, in the church. And so he leaves these directions for public worship in chapter two. He then moves on to talk about the proper organization of the church. Um, and the proper relationship that its members should have with one another. Uh, so chapter 3 talks about elders and deacons um, and women who render auxiliary service in the congregation, um, talking about wives particularly um, of elders and deacons and, and that they also must evidence certain qualities uh, that they might assist and be, and be helpers in the church. Um, but elders and deacons particularly have to be spiritually and morally qualified uh, for the good order of the church, which is the living church of the living God, the church of Jesus Christ, who was manifest in the flesh and taken up into glory. So the regulations given for elders and deacons and for their wives, uh, for those who are offering a secondary auxiliary kind of service in the church. Um, and Paul then moves on to chapter four to talk particularly about the minister, particularly about the things that relate to Timothy's office. Um, he must diligently combat heresy, particularly that a Judaistic form of heresy that was troubling the church at Timothy's time. Um, the minister must attend to the public reading of scripture to preaching and teaching. Uh, the minister must be an example to all in his conduct. Um, and he must know how to, how to deal judiciously with the old and young of either gender. So how to deal with older women and older men and how to deal with younger women and younger men um, in a way that is God honoring. So the, all of those things are tasks that the minister that has to be aware of. Chapter five deals with uh, how to how do widows in the church, how should we think of of their function? And there's a difference in the church uh, in Ephesus between those who were uh, widows who were alone, who did not have children or families to support them. And th those those widows were to be honored by the church. Uh, it seems that the church would support those widows and they would also offer that kind of auxiliary, auxiliary help in the church, uh, helping out as well. And so widows, we're told here, who have children and grandchildren to, to support them don't need to be supported by the church. Their family should support them. Uh, but those who are supported by the church should continue to perform uh, that function in the church of helping the church and have the necessary qualifications that Chapter 5 talks about to help. Um, we're told in Chapter 5 that uh, the elders must be considered worthy of double honor, especially those, particularly those who labor in the word and in teaching, um, and that all the rules that God has given must be kept uh, without discrimination. Uh, chapter 6 moves on to talk about slaves. They must honor and serve their masters, especially when their masters are believers. Um, this is, again, not condoning slavery or saying that slavery was a good institution, uh, but just dealing with the reality. There were going to be Christians who were slaves and how ought they to think about uh, that their service, that they can serve Christ and honor him even in that condition. Um, and then chapters three through 21 uh, talk about particularly riches, uh, the, the dangers of those for those who strive after riches, uh, particularly those who think of uh, godliness as a means of gain, uh, that somehow through teaching uh, the scriptures or through other kinds of godliness that that's a way to make money. Um, there's a real strict warning against that. Um, also, there's a warning that comes to those who are rich, not who are striving for it, but who have it, um, that material possessions must be, uh, those who have them must be sure they don't place their hope in them, um, not in their earthly riches, but in their bountiful God. Um, and Timothy is exhorted to discharge faithfully the mandate that he has received. 
So once again, we see the importance that God places on the church to have uh, order in the church, order among its members, order among its officers, order among those who assist in the church, serving um, not as official office bearers, but serving important functions in the church, that there are qualifications that must be, must be met, and that Paul is concerned that everything is done well in worship, um, that everything is done well in uh, the organization of the church uh, for the well-being of the church together. Um, these things are still important today. Um, we've been having occasion in the life of our church right, right now to talk a lot about the importance of our doctrine of the church. And passages like this show us just how important the Apostle, the Apostle Paul thought the church was and the importance of the instructions that he left behind. So 1 Timothy is really the beginning of, of our look at uh, the pastoral epistles, how important it is for uh, Paul to make sure the pastors that are going to be left in charge of the church when he's gone have a proper understanding of how the church ought to function, how it ought to be organized, how it ought to worship God, so that God is honored in all things, so that false teaching is weeded out, and so that we conduct ourselves the way we ought uh, in the family and the household of God. And so we can be very thankful to have these letters that, that help us to do that, help us to see how important the church is, which is the living, the church of the living God, a pillar and buttress of the truth in this world. Um, and certainly God cares about his church, and we should too. So let's thank God for this word together. Let's pray. Father in heaven, we do thank you for the opportunity we've had to hear from your word and to think about it together. Uh, we thank you for the church. We thank you that you've brought us together as a household of faith uh, to each have our various roles. We know that we don't all fulfill the same role in the church because we are not all called to, to the roles. To every role, we're called to the roles that you've given to us. And we pray that you would help us to fulfill those roles faithfully uh, without any uh, back talk to you or, at, or questioning why we have this role and not another role. May each of us seek just to do the work that you've given to us that we might build up one another together. And so we thank you for uh, how much you care about the, the worship of the church and the proper organization of the church. And we thank you for giving us this guidance to help us. We pray that you would help us to honor our lives in, in the week ahead. We will glorify you in all we say and do. Forgive us our sins, we ask, for we ask them in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, people of God, it's been good to spend this time with you. May the Lord bless you and keep you until we meet again.